Good morning. I wonder what freedom means to you. In Galatians 5, Paul declares, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Christian people, you are free. Christ has set you free. You don't need to be in slavery. These are, are, are great sounding words, aren't they? But what do they mean in real life? What do they mean for someone who feels trapped in a job they hate with no prospects? For you who are seriously restricted by chronic illness or a controlling spouse or any other situation that limits what you can do. For black people who feel oppressed by racist attitudes which still hold them back. For those who still feel locked in at home under Covid restrictions. For churches like ours that are not free to worship as we've always done. For all who cry out, God I wish I was free. What is the answer? Winning the lottery? Get a divorce. A miracle cure. Protest marches. Changing legislation. Bringing down the system. No platforming or sacking those who say things that we disagree with. Breaking the law. Doing our own thing regardless. Now I know that's lumping a lot of diverse things together, I know that. But all these things are either advocated, they're being campaigned for, or they're taking place in our society right now. All in the quest for justice and freedom for individuals, for groups, for segments of society. Some of them may have their place. Does it, however, look like any of them are proving to be the ultimate answer to the cry for freedom. Something to think about. Now of course Christians may well be at the forefront of trying to bring change to our society in the interests of justice and freedom in many different ways. They always have been. So Wilberforce, an evangelical Christian, who gave his life to ending slavery and brought freedom to countless generations, amongst many other things that he did. The Sunday school pioneers who paved the way for education for all and, and the freedom that education can bring. And all who served in two world wars when Britain was a country that believed and trusted in God and people were prepared to come out en masse for days of prayer. All so that the world could be free of fascism and the Nazis. Now of course those things inspire us and they have their rightful place. And we hold in great esteem those who've won precious freedoms. But let's see if we can dig a little bit deeper into what Paul was getting at when he made this triumphant declaration for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. First of all we need to understand that the slavery that Paul was coming up against wasn't, he wasn't talking about literal slaves. Slaves of whom there were many. And it was as accepted then as in Wilberforce's day, perhaps more so. And tragically, it's still a blight on the 21st century, even here in Britain. But the slavery Paul was talking about was slavery to the law. Now, it's important to recognise that the law he is talking about has similarities and differences with our law today. And I want to highlight both this morning. I'll highlight the similarities first and then come to a vital difference. 
So when we think of freedom, we might think about from our school days, the last day of term. Parents out of the house. If you grew old, the boss is on leave. Or out on the hills with the wind blowing through your hair. And that's if you've got any hair. Or freedom for, from any of the things I have already talked about. We love to be free of constraints. I've got news for you this morning. God loves us to be free of constraints. You say, really? I thought Christianity was full of commands. And thou shalt not do this, don't do that. Hmm. Think back. God created us to live freely with minimal restrictions. Minimal. Just one. In the Garden of Eden there was just one rule. Adam and Eve, you are free to eat from any tree except one. Just one. Don't touch that one or you will surely die. But you know the story. How the devil in the form of a snake cast doubt on what God had said. And disobedience and rebellion took place. Sin came into the lives of Adam and Eve and freedom died. Freedom died. Sin always has consequences from day one. Sin destroyed freedom. And sin is destroying freedom to this day. You see, it's sin which brought in laws. Laws mean a loss of freedom. You can't do this, this, that, and a thousand other things. It's tragic. Because we were created to be free. And instead, man's sinfulness has led us to be trapped in a web of legislation. All supposedly for our own good. Of course, it is necessary. See, human freedom, infected by sin, can just lead to anarchy. Every person for themselves. So the laws of the road help us stay safe on the roads. Laws give us a safe structure for society. But they're only ultimately necessary because we have lost the freedom of the innocence of an untarnished relationship with God. Why did God give the Ten Commandments? Because people outside of that original relationship with God needed to know right and wrong. So he gave them the basic principles for a life that was as free, fulfilled and respectful of God and one another as it could possibly be. But by the time Jesus came, things were very different. Israel's history had ebbed and flowed between obeying God and turning after false religion. And over time they, they had developed a whole system of laws which went way beyond the simplicity of the Ten Commandments uh, along with the unpacking of them in, in, in Scripture. So every principle had to be spelt out in detail. Every clause needed sub-clauses. You had to have your definitions. If work is forbidden on the Sabbath, define work. And the law became a massive, unwieldy set of rules and regulations, impossible for an average person to get to grips with. So the Pharisees did it for them. They were the rule makers who condemned the rule breakers. And you know what Jesus thought of the Pharisees? As they argued about minute details and then looked for loopholes for themselves. In case you don't know what he thought about them, he called them to their faces, whitewashed sepulchres, hypocrites. Jesus had every reason to stand in opposition to this massive legislation. He was the son of God and his manifesto in Luke 4, remember quoting the Old Testament, was that he'd come to set people free. He'd come to help people find their way back to the way God intended them to live. Free. I've come to set the prisoners free. You know, our whole legalistic mentality is stronger today than ever. Policies, policies, policies. 
rules, regulations and guidelines at work, in society and in the church. Believe me, I have had my fill of them. Sometimes I feel like I'm drowning under them. The hours I, and along with our church board, have spent studying policies, devising them. Because we have to. Not because we want to, believe me. And just this week and last, we've spent hours trying to get our heads around the COVID-19 guidance for churches. I don't know whether any of you signed up for the, um, the gov.uk guidelines that uh, have been coming out every day since March. I stopped reading most of them after a few days. It was unbelievable. They fill up my email box, dozens every day from the government. How many people and hours have been spent writing them and reading them and interpreting them and expanding on them? It's incredible. Boris started with a simple message. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. We obeyed. I think the government was amazed at just how good most of us were. See, it's amazing how fear can force obedience. Uh, but this was way too simple for, for us people, wasn't it? Because remember all the press conferences and the questions? They all had to be answered with a mountain of legislation and guidance. And Boris, who's a liberal at heart, presided over the most draconian legislation in our recent history. The greatest curtailment of our freedoms in living memory. And now we're gradually being set free, bit by bit, cautiously, slowly. Too slow for some, too fast for others. So we've got the confusing and inconsistent guidelines, for example, for the reopening of churches for worship. You can use a taxi, but you can't offer someone a lift. We can live stream with several singers, but we can only lead worship with one. And the congregation can't sing, but they can't talk. Even though scientific evidence suggests that droplets from both singing and speaking only go 0.5 metres. They're checking that out at the moment with some tests at Salisbury Cathedral. Sneezing and coughing are very different physiologically to singing. So what do we do? Ignore the guidance, do our own thing and risk harming our witness and validating our insurance. Sometimes we need to forego our freedom for the greater good, for the sake of others. And Paul referred to this principle when he talked about food laws. The problem you see is it's simply impossible to cover every base and avoid inconsistencies. The more you try and deal with every particular situation, the more situations you uncover that need to be addressed. And it's like an exponential curve that ultimately does our heads in, sends us screaming to bury our heads in the sand. I can't cope with all this. Do you know what? I think that what Jesus was confronting in the first century was not a lot different to now. A mass of legislation that curtailed the freedoms of every man, woman and child in Israel. And back then the, the Pharisees were the custodians of this law, working it to their advantage, pretending to keep it. But as Jesus said, they were hypocrites. Now I'm not going to make that accusation of anyone today. My sympathies, sympathies have been with our government in trying to deal with a terribly difficult situation. But there are similarities then and now with these masses of legislation which will ultimately collapse under their own weight. Paul was declaring that Christians were free from being enslaved to all of this. They no longer needed to be held captive by the law. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Of course, don't get me wrong. Don't hear everything I'm saying then as now. There were laws in place that were necessary and were to be obeyed. I've already said laws give us a safe structure for our society. And elsewhere Paul wrote about that. 
in Romans chapter 13. Let me read some verses here from Romans 13 and verses 1 to 7. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that have exist have been established by God. And then in verse 6. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. And so there's some principles there about how we live under government under laws and paying taxes but to get our heads around uh, the, this apparent contradiction here between the freedom we have and the requirement to obey the law we need to recognize an important difference between then and now between Israel then and the UK today and if we don't recognise this difference, we risk serious mis misunderstanding. And one of the differences is this. The law Paul was writing about was all centred on God. Remember the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. That's, that was the, the linchpin, the starting point. Now in a world where everybody worshipped this tin pot God or that clay idol, the law was all about pleasing the one true God by the way you honoured him and respected other people. And it was also taken to have the intention of making people acceptable to God. The idea that people could be made righteous by obeying the law. And this would make them then acceptable to God. Now of course I am simplifying, oversimplifying this somewhat to fit this into half an hour. And also because the danger is that we, we can overcomplicate things. Then we can't see the wood for the trees. So I want us to get the big picture this morning. Uh, Jesus himself simplified things. He condensed the law into its essentials. Two things. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind, and your neighbour as yourself. So their laws were God-centred. Jesus' simplification was also God-centred. Our British culture and laws used to be God-centred. But gradually that's been stripped away bit by bit. So one simple example is, is the old laws that we had on Sunday trading, which were a direct product of the Ten Commandments and, and honouring the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now in our secularised culture, years ago they were perceived as no longer relevant and were largely scrapped while retaining some provisions to look after workers' rights. But once people stopped believing in God, we became a secular, a multicultural society. The next step was for God to be shunted out of the legal framework as an irrelevance to life in general. When they were at the heart of the law for Israel, the whole of life centred on God, pleasing him. Not so for us today. But human nature abhors a vacuum. And, and people fill that God-shaped hole in our legal framework. So I want to suggest, without passing judgment on any of the following, here's what seeks to fill that gap. To please whatever or whoever fills the gap left where God ought to be. Whoever represents the people can fill that gap. Whoever shapes the will of the people or claims to represent it or political parties. The print media, they used to dominate. The strongest voice, the loudest voice on social media. The liberal elite, so are called. The winners of the battle last year between Remainers and Brexiteers. Environmentalists, Extinction Rebellion. Women's rights, gay rights, trans rights. But now it's civil war in the rights movement as trans rights are trashing women's rights. And let's be honest too, the Christian lobby who seek to preserve rules or modify them for what we may feel are very good reasons. 
And then, this year, out of the blue, COVID-19, with massive legislative impact. And now we've got those who are scared of a second wave, and those who are desperate for a loosening up, competing for influence in changing the law and the guidance. People are trying to fill the hole in the heart of our legal framework. Debate, discussion, influence leading to legislation, but which has a God-shaped hole at its heart, so it's no longer coherent to a Christian way of life. Instead it coheres around whatever are the loudest voices about what's best for people. But even as we might want to hark back to the idea that we need the kind of legislation that Israel had, be careful. Because Paul was not saying that at all. Because one of the big problems was that the law was, was a chunky, blunt tool which could never really fulfil what people were desperately looking for. Whether it was acceptance by God then or peace of heart and mind today. Paul was saying that something else much deeper was required and he completely refuted the idea that people could be made acceptable to God by keeping the law. Christ came to destroy that whole idea. You don't win favour with God by doing God, by obeying rules, by your good deeds outweighing your mistakes on the scales of life. By your good deeds outweighing your evil deeds on the scales of life. That's not the way it works, Jesus said. And Paul preached to. There's got to be more to living in freedom as God intended than being legalistic. It's a matter of the heart. Remember the story of that rich young ruler who asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life. He said he kept all the law from childhood. Jesus told him it wasn't enough. Give away all your wealth to the poor, he said. And the man went away sorrowful because he was very wealthy and his wealth had captured his heart. He could never be free until he'd given it away. And it was just because the Galatian believers were forgetting what they had been taught that they were slipping back to this wrong way of thinking. I'm going to read some verses now from, from the early chapters of uh, Galatians. I've given you the gist, but let's just hear what Scripture says. Galatians 1, verses 6 and 7. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning away to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Galatians 3, verses 2 to 5. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Galatians 3, 21 to 23. Well then, is there a conflict between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could have given us new life, we could have been made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures have declared that we are all prisoners of sin. So the only way to receive God's promise is to believe in Jesus Christ. Until faith in Christ was shown to us as the way to becoming right with God, we were guarded by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until we could put our faith in the coming Saviour. Galatians 4, 3-7 and that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were slaves to the spiritual powers of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him 
to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because you Gentiles have become his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts and now you can call God your dear father. Now you are no longer a slave but God's own child and since you are his child everything he has belongs to you. Galatians 4 and verses 8 to 12. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. And now that you have found God, or should I say that God has found you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual powers of this world? You're trying to find favour with God by what you do or don't do on certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. I am afraid that all my hard work for you was worth nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles were, free from the law. Galatians 5 verses 13 to 18. For you've been called to live in freedom, not freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. But if instead of showing love among yourselves, you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I advise you, verse 16, to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what the, your sinful nature craves. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature wants. And these two forces are constantly fighting each other and your choices are never free from this conflict. But when you're directed by the Holy Spirit, you are no longer subject to the law. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Don't be subject to the yoke of slavery to the law once again. Could we have slipped back into slavery? A legalistic faith full of do's and don'ts and our society with all its laws top heavy with laws pushes us in that direction we're overburdened with legislation and it can easily creep into the church because people look for clarity and precision because it feels safer it's not always possible and it is actually stultifying demotivating and can be destructive Give me freedom, not anarchy. Give me God-given freedom any day. Is it possible that we may have lost sight of what makes the gospel such good news? About a heart change, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the gift of the Spirit, freedom from the inside out, not necessarily by changing our circumstances, I mean, though that may come too. So we're set free to live differently, not purely by obligation, forced obedience, but based on a relationship with God who is at the heart of our lives. And we want to please him and we want to please others because we've been set free by a glorious, wonderful gospel freedom it's ours it's a gift to anyone who chooses to follow jesus and by the way it's totally free more on all of that next time i speak when i'll be looking at uh, some more from galatians thanks for listening